Ladies and gentlemen, the Greek atomists were wrong, okay? Sorry about that. People have said, how do you think the Greeks came up with their theory of atomism? It wasn't from, from sensory evidence or whatever, it was from deductive logic. Now that's not even true. They actually came up with it if, if you've read the words that the Greeks wrote down about this, and I wouldn't be surprised if these people who attack me haven't read the stuff. The Greek atomists did have basic evidence. They mentioned, for example, that a wheel turning on an axle, although you don't ever see anything really disappear, over time it does wear out. Or a gold ring on one's finger, over time, wears away, although there is nothing visible seemingly that's going away. So everything in the universe, it must be, can be divided down and down and down, smaller and smaller, to some particle which is the basis of everything. Okay? and that particle can't be divided. Now, tom is Greek for divide or cut and a is Greek for non, like if you're apolitical that means you're non-political well an a tom is a non-dividable or non-cuttable. Even if you want to say the Greeks were right there is a basic thing called the atom. Even if you want to say they were right which they weren't because they didn't have any evidence for it. Even if you want to say they were right you have to admit that there is not uh, a basic um, building block of the universe that can't be um, cut. There isn't. There are 106 of them. That's different from saying there's one basic thing that we can't divide. And the Greeks were also wrong about that. We can divide it. Well, okay, so the Greeks weren't talking about atoms then. They were talking about uh, protons and neutrons. Oh no, those are made of quarks, right? Oh, they were talking about quarks then. Oh wait, that can be divided too. See Einstein's equation. Energy is what matter is made of. Matter is nothing but cold energy. So the Greeks were wrong through, thoroughly through and through. The only thing they got right was there are little things we can't see that constitute stuff. And they didn't ever prove that and there's no, no way for you to say that they got to that through deductive logic or whatever. It was a hunch. And I don't think you can say that they were right. Now the reason that uh, I, I did a video, I'm sure, called The Right Decision for the Wrong Reason is the Wrong Decision. Well, the right conclusion for the wrong reason is the wrong conclusion. Okay? In order for us to discover atoms and what atoms are doing and how to deal with them in order to discover the 106 basic elements and that's like 114 now or something but the, the last ones are man-made and they're extremely unstable and they fall apart in the laboratory after just a nanosecond or whatever so in order for us to discover those we had to come at the theory with evidence and the Greeks didn't they only had anecdotal evidence that they could sit in an armchair and philosophize about they didn't have any actual on the ground evidence such as Brownian motion, for example, um, the random interaction of particles and stuff like this. Oh, let's see, there was a scientist. Who was the scientist who took, uh, he put pollen particles into water and watched very closely under a microscope, maybe, or something like this? Um, and he saw the pollen molecules dancing. Now there's no reason for them to do that unless something's making them do that. And they, they don't have a battery inside or anything. They're just pieces of pollen. How are they dancing? Because the atoms around them are bumping and jiggling against them. That was real world evidence. And we can take real world evidence and experiment further, find out more. But if you start with the wrong reason for believing in atoms, I believe in atoms because there must be something that can't be divided, then you're going to go about investigating this by cutting things until you can't cut them anymore or something like that. You're going to go about it incorrectly because you're just doing it on a hunch rather than from evidence of the real world and you're never going to get anywhere. So for them to have come to the conclusion, they've come to the conclusion there's something that's not dividable. For them to come to that conclusion doesn't mean that they've said uh, the correct thing. It doesn't mean that they were right. They were actually wrong. Okay, there's not one substance that's undividable. There are 106, and they can be divided. Yeah. Theories are not made through deductive logic. Okay? Theories are made through induction, 
from a body of evidence, facts. Okay? Let me just give a quick example and then I'll get off the soapbox on this subject. Benjamin Franklin made um, his uh, theory of, of, of lightning, that it's electricity, not by sitting in his armchair and saying, oh, lightning looks very similar to this static electricity when I pet my cat. No, not by sitting in his armchair, but I, actually by doing tests in the real world to show that rubbing this uh, wheel puts a charge into the Leyden jar, and flying the kite with this silk string going into the Leyden jar puts a charge into the Leyden jar. There. Now they're the same thing. Now, he did not do that through deductive logic. The best you can do is come to a hypothesis through deductive logic from facts. Okay? But the thing about a theory, the thing about making the leap that Benjamin Franklin did is, You've got to say, you've got to go in a certain sense, you've got to go beyond all the facts, but you've got to do it using those facts. Okay? He, he did not go to every corner of the world and test every rain cloud and every lightning bolt. No, he didn't need to. He did it in Philadelphia, and he told everybody what lightning was. Lightning is electricity, is static electricity built up in the clouds. That's what lightning is. He didn't have to go test it in Venezuela and Bermuda and France to see if it was the same over there because he induced. He didn't deduce. Deduce is to take the evidence you have and just get something that's within that evidence. He induced. He said all these are true and then he made a leap and said therefore this other thing is true all places and all times. It's true that the lightning bolt put a charge into the Leyden jar and it will be true if anyone else does this experiment anytime, anywhere in the future, because lightning is, has a nature of its own. Now, don't say anything like, well, what about sulfur clouds on Venus? You know, maybe they have a different form of lightning. Maybe they do, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about lightning on Earth from the clouds that we have on Earth. Um, induction is, is coming to a conclusion based on the facts, using the facts, but going beyond what the facts say. Okay? J him just getting the Leyden jar to get a charge doesn't say that electricity is everywhere all over the world all the time. But his mind can say that. His mind can take that and, and make the leap. Now, some people take that for granted. Okay, he was able to make that inductive leap. But today, if you try to say anything like that in the realm of science, if you try to make an inductive leap, they will come up with 1,199 questions for you, like if they were in Ben Franklin's time, the academicians and college professors would say, um, the, of today, transported back, they would say, I, I don't know, you're jumping to conclusions here. Have you tried um, to charge a Leyden jar from lightning on a high mountain? Have you tried it on Tuesdays? Have you tried it while you had jam in your belly from breakfast? Have you tried it while you're wearing a straw hat? Have you tried it from the top of the Eiffel Tower, which didn't exist, the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Uh, they would say, you, you cannot make this conclusion. You can't make this broad-reaching conclusion. You've got to do more testing and verification stuff. That's why uh, we've got so much crap like string theory and stuff going on today. Not, not that things aren't being accomplished instead of actual accomplishments. They are just not by the educational institutions. All right, off the soapbox. Yeah, the Greek atomists were wrong. There's not one single indivisible thing. We use the word atom now, but it's not what they defined it as, something that can't be divided. And it, it can be divided, and there are 106 flavors. The Greek atomists were wrong.